Hey, and welcome back everyone to our RISC-V Rust hacking sessions here. Uh, we're currently working on the Orboot project again, and today we're gonna have another closer look at the Vision 5.2 development board, uh, of which I'm just holding the case here because the board is already wired up here and sitting on my desk. And what I'm going to dive into a bit today is what I've actually been doing over the last few months where, well, we haven't had a live stream. And that is first up the so-called SBI, the supervisor binary interface implementation for it. Secondly, issues I've run into with a memory and aligned access, which is what I've highlighted here from the RISC-V privilege specification. And we'll have a closer look at that in a bit. And well, we have finally brought up a Linux kernel uh, we got a user land to work, which, well, is also where we ran into issues with uh, this alignment stuff here. And, well, eventually we got to the point where we could also use Ethernet. So, yeah, we can't yet use all the peripherals. There is still some work in progress there and more on that than in a bit. So let's dive right into what I've been doing. And let me quickly switch over again to my terminal emulator here. Uh, where, you know, we have our project open. So yeah, this is now in the Orbit repository. It's a uh, current still work in progress branch, which, uh, you know, I will file very soon for uh, being ready to get merged at some point. There are still some discussion points, but, you know, in, in general, things are uh, working quite nicely right now. And so what we have done here now is for the Vision 5.2 board, we now have two stages. We already did that for, you know, drafting around having a small test payload at some point because we only uh, focused on the first stage until we eventually had DRAM implemented so far. And well, I can show you now we have two directories here. Just disregard the uh, log files that I have. Uh, there is one which is called BT0. And there is one which is called main, which corresponds to the two stages that we have in the Orboot design. So the BT0 stage is the one which only has SRAM so far, right? So when you boot up the machine, there is no DRAM that you can use that. BT0 will initialize that, then load the main stage into it, and then hand over to it. So that will then be running in DRAM, and in turn again, you know, load any other next payload, which is mostly a Linux kernel for our purposes, but could actually be anything that you want. So you will notice there is another directory here. It's called lib. And that is mostly because there is like a bunch of code which can be shared between those two stages. Now on the other side, I also have something open, which is called SBI here, the SBI directory. So what we also have done over the last few months is I factored out the SBI code from our implementation that we already had for the all winner D1, but we really just kept it in its own directory for the time being, you know, until we were actually clear about like, okay, what, what can we actually factor out? You know, what has to be platform specific and so on. And it turns out that we can share a fair amount of code actually. So yeah, this here is now the directory. Um, there is a few files only which are, uh, you know, really like mostly relevant to us now. Uh, there are those two here, execute RS and runtime RS. Those are, let's say, um, the main surface that you would then need to work with, you know, when you implement something uh, based on Orboot. So let's say you want to port another board, then those are the two that you would need to look into, you know, to understand the API a bit. Um, we have this file here, it's called just info rs. It's actually very, very tiny. So you can see it's only 300 kilobytes, uh, bytes actually, sorry. Uh, so it's really just a very few lines of code. Uh, then there is csr.rs, which is mostly helpers for accessing things. And then there is a special directory, it's called feature. Well, this is where we've uh, you know implemented a, a few trap handlers and stuff like that. The really necessary one. So. The thing is, in Orboot, we don't actually want to do a lot of trap and interrupt handling because that is what the operating system is supposed to do. So what we essentially do instead is we delegate all the responsibilities of handling everything regarding the platform to the kernel, all the ones that we actually can. So there are very few exceptions where the kernel, which is you know often running in the supervisor 
privileged mode. So that is a lower, well, lesser privileged uh, mode in that sense. It doesn't have full access to the machine, and that's why you know we still need to handle some things in machine mode. So that's the mode that uh, Oraboot code is mostly running in. Well, but you can still use uh, Oraboot to actually run all of your code in M mode as well. We will keep that configurable. Yeah, uh, configurable. So Linux is just implemented in a way that it would run in S mode. So we do drop into S mode to execute a Linux kernel. So let's now have a look at this here. I created a tiny script, which, um, you know, currently is like my tiny little build system, if you will. It doesn't really do much. Let's have a quick look at that. So what it really does is, well, it changes its directory. Uh, well, no, it doesn't actually change the directory. Uh, there is a directory configured here, which I just call kdir. Uh, this is where I have my Linux kernel, and this is where I load my device tree from. So what I'm currently doing is, I put a Linux kernel in the flash part on the board at a certain offset where we still have plenty of free space. So we have like about 12 megabytes of free space. You know, everything else is covered by U-boot at this point and, you know, uh, its previous stages. Um, so what I then do is I build the main stage, I build the BT0 stage, and I actually hand over uh, this command here it's called run with payload so what it does is it builds the stage takes the device tree blob loads all of that into s frame eventually everything in one thing you know and then runs it and eventually we attach picocom so that we get a zero console and you can see i have some configuration here and that is mostly because i was switching like between different kernel versions i was switching between uh, you know, different uh, USB adapters, just, you know, because sometimes I was traveling around and I had different ones with me. Um, but yeah, nevertheless, so this is now the uh, build setup and for running uh, the machine now, uh, well, using our code. So the main directory is now what contains like most of the interesting code for today. So let's have a quick look at that. Um, it's really not much as I'm saying, uh, as you can see, there is only a few files. So there is one which is called main.rs, our main entry point. There is one which is called uart.rs, that is our uart driver. Uh, we don't have that shared yet currently between the two stages. We might at some point, but yeah, it's not too relevant right now. Well, and then there is something which is called SBI platform RS, which we will also look into a bit. And that is actually then implementing things, you know, uh, which we need to hand over to the SBI thing that we have here on this side, uh, which is actually shared. So if, if we look at this here, uh, that directory is uh, source arc source risk 564 SBI in the orbit project. So let's have a look at the main file here now in the main stage. And so first up, you can see I have defined a ton of constants here. And that is, you know, also something that at some point will be done by our build system. So this is really like lots of memory addresses and offsets and stuff because we currently, you know, just piece things together a bit. Um, there is now the same thing that you also know from the previous stage. So this is like, you know, the basic setup until we can actually run Rust code. So technically we don't really have to do all of this again because we did most of that already in the uh, BT0 stage, but we definitely need to set up our stack. And currently this is also just for a single heart. So bear in mind, we cannot yet uh, use multiple hearts that will also be worked on again in the future. Uh, there, there is something which says, wait for multi heart to get back into the game, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not really implemented yet. Um, yeah, this year, uh, well, it's uh, just the uh, clearing of like, you know, volatile data that we have. And well, then let's look at the actual main function. So there, there is a bunch of helpers here, which we are going to use. Um, but the main function really starts down here. Uh, I implemented a very, very tiny delay. And that is so that when we come from the previous stage and there was still something being printed on the UART, you know, we don't uh, interfere too much. So yeah, the first thing we then do is, well, we initialize our logger uh, by, you know, giving the UART to it uh, this way. So it's really just two lines. Then we already print or boot. We say it's the main stage. Now I just put that in here. Um, what else do we do? Uh, this here is just mostly for debugging. You know, I'm just printing uh, a few parts 
Uh, this is where we expect Linux to be in the flash part. So this is the Linux boot source address. It's really just the memory mapped spy flash here. I'm just dumping a few bytes from it. Um, actually, I also uh, put something here. Uh, so at some point I was copying the compressed kernel over to uh, DRAM, so we don't even need that. So we can actually remove that right away. Um, yeah, we don't even need to print this here. So we can also remove that part. Uh, so the first thing we're actually meaning for doing then is we copy the device tree blob to DRAM. So the device tree blob is what tells the Linux kernel like what peripherals we have, where they are, you know, how to handle them, how they are actually are related to each other, what sock actually the kernel is running on because it, you know, is portable. You can run it on multiple different SOCs. Um, we then decompress the kernel. So our payload in the sense here currently it's a Linux kernel. When that is extracted, we do a tiny little check. We just uh, check a few uh, spaces in memory, uh, which is where we expect, you know, something uh, that you can actually find in the Linux kernel always at that position. You know, it's by convention, we can do that as a little check. Uh, same with the DTB. So we also did that here, actually, I just skipped that. Um, yeah, this here is currently commented out that will be for multi hard support at some point. Well, and then we already execute our payload. And what is this uh, payload function here doing? Well, it's down here. It initializes the SBI for the platform because there are parts which are specific to this platform. It initializes its runtime then. So that is mostly what is coming from over here and will picks up part of what we initialized over there. And then we already run the Linux kernel by saying execute supervisor. We give it the Linux of the uh, the address of the Linux kernel, this is what we extracted to memory. So this Linux boot adder or address is the address in memory. Uh, we also need to pass on the hard ID. So Linux knows what hard it's currently starting on and the device tree blobs address so that Linux knows where to actually catch it from uh, in memory. And that's already it. That's all we're doing in the stage. So as you can see from a high level perspective, it's really not that much. So we already know the like kernel extraction, all of that. That is something we've already done on other platforms. There is really nothing special about it. So what we are now going to look at is actually those two things here, the initialization of the specific SBI platform here, well, or the platforms parts for SBI, and then the SBI runtime. So at that point, we will be looking on this side here. Um, let's actually close the other side again. So I really just wanted to show, uh, you know, the directory structure here a bit. Um, so yeah, let's uh, now start right away with the SBI platform. And when we do that, we see, well, there is this init function here, which is again, calling into a few other things. And it's also actually not that much. Um, there is something which is called IPI. Uh, this is for, um, well, uh, good question, actually. Uh, it's the intrapending something. Uh, this is for, you know, uh, marking that we actually have interrupts pending. Uh, we, we can look at the details in a bit. Then there are uh, fence instructions that, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, it cannot be used directly from Linux on that platform. So we need to provide an interface for it. Uh, this is now the init remote fence function here. So we implement something that is called our fence. Actually, that all comes from uh, Rust SBI. So if you look at this here, uh, there is a bunch of things that we take here from Rust SBI and you will see a, a few uh, more down uh, in the code. So same thing with the timer. So the timer is also something we unfortunately need to handle in SBI. So we do that here, we say init timer and then we say init reset. That is currently actually not really implemented, so it's uh, not really doing anything. Um, so yeah, let's actually go backwards now. Let's jump down to the init reset function. As you can see, it doesn't really do anything. Uh, it would just panic, right? So yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, this is, um, I just jumped into the code from Rust SBI itself. We, we need to look at our implementation of reset, sorry. So. Yeah, it is uh, this trade down here. And as you can see, it doesn't really actually do anything. It just returns an SBI red. And well, that contains an error with this uh, reset magic thing. 
uh, and this reset reason thing here. So yeah, there is nothing implemented yet. We would need to do that at some point. Um, so coming back here, now let's look at the implementation of the timer. So the timer is down here. Uh, the timer is a bit special. Um, there are a few functions that we need. So we need to be able to set the timer. Uh, I have some debug prints here which say, hey, we're now setting the timer. Then we call a function here and then we say, hey, the timer has been set. And what this here does is, and that is coming from our little library here, uh, you know, that third directory we have, um, it is really just writing a bunch of registers here at the same time. Well, and it's doing that for, you know, the respective heart that you need. So yeah, it's really just a little helper function here. Um, well, we then read out the current time and we do a bit of a comparison here. You know, if we have overflown uh, the current time value that is uh, being set and well, if so, we would then um, set an interrupt here. Uh, so first we would clear something and then we would say set as timer. Um, yeah, and vice versa here if we haven't exceeded the time limit yet. I'm not even sure to be honest if this here is fully correct. Uh, it sort of seems to work now. So yeah, that is something I would really like someone to verify uh, who understands this uh, thing a bit better. Um, now let's look at the R fence thing. And to be honest, I've mostly looked into OpenSBI to, you know, copy over the implementation from there, you know, just <laughs> rewriting in a different language in C in, in, in this instance here. So I'm just running a few assembly uh, things here. So this is an S fence instruction, fence I and another fence. I'm not even sure what that really does. I think this here is flushing the trans, uh, translation look aside buffer or TLB for short, the S fence VMA instruction. Um, yeah, if you want to read more on this, I would encourage you to look at the um, well, the ISA documentation actually where, you know, all the different instructions are documented. Um, yeah, this fence.i from what I understand is for the local heart. Well, and you know, you need to implement these mechanisms now where uh, the kernel would say, hey, I need to do something with that heart. Okay, please send, uh, you know, put an interrupt here or something. Um, it, it, it's a bit strange if you've uh, not really done a lot with that. And well, I haven't, so <laughs> I'm not too versed in this. Uh, there is two other functions here. Uh, there is this one and that one, uh, SFENS VMA ASID. I'm not too sure about it, actually. And then the VMA variant without ASID. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure if that is ever used by Linux currently. Um, I think it's not because I've only seen uh, something from here maybe at some point. So yeah, uh, jumping back again, there is now the IPI thing. IPI, um, yeah, as you can see here. So, oh, I, I, I teased that. I haven't really elaborated on that. So every time you see impl here, so we're implementing a trait that is like, you know, some uh, something, you, you can say it's some predefined thing in Rust. So it tells you, okay, you need to have a certain specific set of functions. They have to need the signature and so on. So it's a bit like interface in Java, if you know that, or you know other languages also have the same uh, concept in a way or similar ones. So yeah, we implement Rust SBI IPI, and we implement that for a struct that we call IPI that we defined here. So yeah, it's uh, really just con uh, keeping the same naming here for consistency and convenience, so that you you know don't get too confused like which API actually so we have namespacing for that in Rust and that is also why we're saying uh, we impl Rust SBI IPI here so we have no collision right so this here is prefix always with Rust SBI. All right so what do we do here well uh, there is actually just a bit that you need to set in the uh, local interrupter the clint so we can look at that as well uh, by looking at this function here set IPI um, and I hope I've done this right, actually. So yeah, now depending on the hard ID, uh, we need to set this uh, register. It's called MSIP. Uh, I think it's like machine something interrupt pending. I actually forgot what the S was for. Well, and then we just write the value one into it. So one means, oh, hey Ben, uh, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining. Uh, yeah, hope you're uh, doing well. Uh, I actually just, uh, uh, yeah, uh, started like, I don't know, maybe 
half an hour ago already? I'm not even sure. Uh, no, not, not even. Like 20 minutes ago, maybe. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you missed anything. Anyway, so, yeah, continuing here, um, there is, like, the kind of hard function down here, which is clearing the bit, so we just write a zero into that register. And that register really just holds a single bit, so it's fine to just say one or zero, so you don't need to care about the other bits in that. Um, yeah, the function of the, uh, the uh, definition of that comes from here, actually. So you see, this is for the clint, so the clint base register is that one here, like the base memory address. And then the first register is uh, for hard zero. Uh, and then, you know, just right after that come the other ones. And at a slightly different offset are the registers for uh, the timer. So, yeah, all of that is in the core local interrupter or clint. Um, yeah, I put the notes always here, like for reference, you know, so that you can look at the menu, uh, manual. Um, yeah, this one here is a bit off. I don't know why they chose this address BFF8. Anyway, this is where uh, the timer itself sits. Um, and I think that is actually something like sort of standardized. I think the uh, D1 actually has the same offset. So yeah, we can actually you know define something that we can also share across uh, different SOCs at some point. So yeah, uh, back to this here. Um, so yeah, that was it actually for you know all of that stuff. So you, you see it's really not too much. Um, and with that in mind, so what you uh, what you need to consider now is, so all that we have set up is we have passed something to global objects that you know the uh, Rust SBI crate understands and predefines. And now when we go back to our main file where we came from, uh, here. So we're now looking at the runtime, and now when we look at the runtime, you see that it actually you know, refers back to a few things that we did here. So yeah, first up, uh, we also have another init function again. So in this init function, we do, well, essentially just two things. So we set the machine trap vector. So the trap vector says, okay, this is now where I have my trap handler. So whenever a trap occurs, you know, there is like a small table uh, where there is a mapping between like um, this and that trap goes to that and that function. That's really uh, the gist of it. And then we call this function here, which is saying we delegate the interrupt exceptions. And this delegating part is what I mentioned earlier, where we actually want the Linux kernel to you know, just handle everything itself. So let's have a look at that. Um, I iterated over that quite a bit, and I also looked at OpenSBI, and OpenSBI actually delegates way less. Um, if you look at this here, uh, there is something which is called ME delegate. ME is the uh, machine mode um, exceptions. So exceptions are, you know, what are uh, causing the traps here. And they write this value, B109. Uh, however, I wanted to do something more. So I'm writing, uh, I'm not even sure if this is accurately cur uh, accurate currently, uh, B151. So you see a few more bits are being set here. And we might actually, um, I think I actually also said that one additional bit here again, uh, that was like the, um, there is something that can trigger a debugger. Uh, I, I forgot its name. So yeah, this is our delegating interrupt exceptions. And well, what you need to keep in mind here, there are two types of things. So there is interrupts and there is exceptions respectively mi delic is for delegating interrupts and me delic is for delegating exceptions and th they are now the interesting ones here and something i actually wanted to dive a bit deeper today into so there is something and you, you see there is variables here well or constants if you will uh which are saying handle misaligned and that is also what you see here we're saying set instruction misaligned. We're saying set instruction fault. And all of those things here, also clear load or set load misaligned, uh, set store misaligned, all of those delegations are for non-aligned memory access. And what does that actually mean? So um, if, if you don't know about this, it might be a bit uh, complicated to explain. Well, I can actually open a, a second 
yeah, let's let's edit a new file here. Uh, let's just call it whatever. So um, let's imagine uh, this here is now our memory. So we can uh, we can imagine our memory, you know, a bit like a table, right? So uh, I'm I'm just okay. Let's just copy that over. Um, so let, let's say we we have this uh, you know chunk of memory here. So let's say this here is now our uh, zeroth byte. Uh, this is number one, number two. I actually just missed adding another column. So uh, let's actually copy that again and put it here. So this would be uh, number three. And then we continue with four, five, six, seven, and so on. And so what we now want to do is, uh, how would this continue actually? So it's like, I don't know, eight. Uh, so this would be like 12, 16, uh, 20. So up until uh, 23, right? So yeah, let's let's imagine this is our memory. I'm, I'm not filling in everything here because I, w I just want to highlight one thing. So our architecture here uh, is made in such a way that we can hold a 32-bit value in a register that we can read from somewhere in memory now, uh, you know, just using one instruction. So we can say, hey, we want to load 32 bits from that and that position in memory into a register. Okay. Now here's a tiny issue with that. So if you do this at this position, you know, you would just take this line here, right? So it's just this one line. You, you start at zero. Okay. So you want 32 bits. In other words, 32, uh, 30, you want 32 bits or in other, uh, other words, four bytes, right? So you would load byte zero, one, two, and three. That is all good. Now there is another possibility. Let's say you actually want to uh, start loading from the, well, one byte off. So you want to start loading from the second byte or, you know, byte one. And now you want to load 32 bits again, right? So you would need to load these here and that fellow down here. Now that is something um, which is in this sense that we are in here now, not aligned. So it's not aligned to the four bytes that we have in each row. So you need to know we have 32 bit alignment on this platform. Now the problem is either the hardware would need to be able to handle this or you need to do something in software so that you do not need to do those accesses. So whatever data you would have, you would need to spread it that it always is aligned at 32 bit boundaries. So in other words, let's say you want to actually store a Boolean value, right? So technically you only need a single bit to represent that. That would make sense. Uh, but because you need to have the 32 bit alignment, well, you would actually need to use a full 32 bits in here. So technically what you could do is uh, you could make things a bit more compact and, you know, then uh, extract them again. And that would mean that you would need to operate on registers at some point. So when you've already loaded something from memory into a register, you can still take that apart again and, you know, uh, then keep things a bit more compact down here. But yeah, that, that is now uh, beyond the point that we're making here. So now comes the thing, risk five, does not specify how a specific platform should do this. It actually leaves it up to the implementation, whether the hardware could actually handle this sort of unaligned access or whether it would raise an exception instead. And then you would need to handle something in software again and say, okay, now we, you know, address memory in a bit of a different way and stuff. And that is what I've already highlighted here in the documentation. So what it says here is, and this is um, relative to this table here, which defines a hierarchy for exceptions. Um, well, a set of priorities. It says the relative priority of load and store AMO uh, address misaligned and page fall exceptions is implementation defined to flexibly cater 
the two design points, uh, two, two design points. Implementations that never support misaligned accesses, that would mean you can only read these, you know, 32 bits aligned, can unconditionally raise the misaligned address exception without performing address translation or protection checks. That goes on a bit. But this is now the most important, this one sentence is the most important sentence of this whole thing here. So I had the following issue. On the all winner D1 platform, I could just access memory arbitrarily. I could do unaligned access. I wasn't even aware of this alignment stuff at all. And now on the Vision 5.2 board, which is based on Sci-5 course, they are actually raising exceptions for unaligned memory access. And let me actually uh, demonstrate that now. So we can look at this in a live example by just running our code. So for running our code, I will now wire up my board and I will now run the script, uh, which is now loading our code into SRAM, it will execute it, it will uh, implement, uh, it will just run our SBI code, which implements the handlers. And then we will be starting a Linux kernel that we load from flash. Well, and then because we also have Ethernet working now, I can CPU into the machine and do things, you know, as we've done before. So let me already do a split view here. So yeah, you see on the left hand side, a Linux kernel is coming up. It's printing some errors currently. Those are currently coming from a specific peripheral. It's the cryptography uh, acceleration. Um, yeah, you would see something here, there. It's a star five crypt something. So crypt for cryptography. Um, yeah, the probing is somehow failing, but, but yeah, that shouldn't really concern us right now. So what we can now do is you see on the left hand side, we just got an IP address and everything. So we can now CPU into the machine and let's say we can run the LS command, right? So we can just list what is in the root directory. Uh, we, we can use the uname command, right? So we see our kernel and, you know, we, we could also run this uh, program that I made at some point, which is just, you know, reading out like available memory. Uh, it's reading the uh, architecture that we're running on the micro architecture. So on, in this case here, it's uh, the cores which are coming from Sci-5 and we get the specific ISA string. So as you can see, you know, we have a, a lot of extensions which are available here. We see our command line, kernel version and so on. All good. So now I want to do something. Um, let's say I have a kernel module that I want to load now. So we can do this remotely, right? So we could run the insmod command. We can uh, we can build the module here in our machine now, and we can load that into memory on the other side. So let's see what happens when we just do that. So I will switch to uh, our uh, Linux directory here. So this is where I've already built uh, a bunch of kernel modules now. I've built two for you know USB support and uh, USB storage. So for USB storage, I need a, a SCSI and uh, like a, a USB storage module, right? So uh, let me uh, take this here from, you know, I tried this earlier so that I can show this right now. Um, so I will now run this command and then I will quickly turn off the board because we will see something. So I will run this right now. It will try an ins mod. Now you see, ooh, 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 it's printing a lot of uh, store misaligned, store misaligned, store misaligned. So yeah, let me scroll up here again and we can see where it actually started. And that was uh, here. So what you can see is it is this here, right? So it says set set something, location something, set, set, and then store misaligned. So these are really just a bunch of debug uh, uh, nodes that we can use here. Um, let's actually store that in a file. So let's call it, uh, let's call it misaligned.log. So this is what we get. Um, so what happens here? So you see it's trying to access a memory address uh, here. 
and 4040. This is now the um, address in, uh, in the Linux kernel where uh, the instruction is actually trying to be performed. And well, you, you see the memory locations up here. So something that ends in a zero, that is all good. Something that ends in a four, that is all good. Um, something that ends in a two, that is not very good. So that is not aligned axis and neither is that you're uh, ending in a six, right? So six is not divisible by four and neither is two. So we can just look at the last digit because, uh, you know, these are hex values. So one digit would always be values from zero to 15. Anyway, so let's now see what we actually have with the Linux kernel um, at that address. And so I will just switch to that again. Uh, so we will look at the obj dump and we will now scroll down to this memory address for the for zero. And at that position, we will find an instruction, which is then storing in memory. So let's do a search like this. Ah, and there you see, this is a store instruction. So S is for store, L is for load, right? And we can also see uh, what function this is coming from. So there is a function in the Linux kernel, which is called apply R risk 564 Rela, I think it's for relative something. Um, could also be, I don't know. Uh, if, if anybody knows, uh, you know, feel free to write it in the comments or something. Anyway, so this function now can perform a misaligned axis. So what we can do is either of multiple things. So first up, we could redesign our hardware. Our hardware currently here is given, right? So we work with something that we just bought off the shelf. So that is not something we can do. Uh, we can now implement a handler in our SBI, which would take care of this. You know, it would need to store the current context somewhere. It would then need to see, hey, how do we access the memory now? You know, it would need to do something so that it's aligned again. Uh, then it will need to read that value or, well, in, in this case, store that value in an aligned uh, manner. And then it would need to restore the context again and pass back to the Linux kernel. Now, this is a somewhat very expensive way of handling this, right? So you're switching to a different processor mode and you need to do a lot of these operations. So that is what OpenSBI is doing. And somebody actually did a measurement. They wrote it in the sci-fi forums and they wrote that it's a 300 times performance penalty just for doing misaligned access. So, what else could we do? We could actually do this in Linux ourselves. So we could also define a handler in Linux. Now the problem is we would still need to like store the current context somehow. We would need to do our operation and restore the context again and then continue. That is also still very expensive. So we're not really saving that much. I'm not even sure if there is even a big difference uh, between like having to actually switch the different processor modes or not. So lastly, we could also just fix our code and change it so that it always performs aligned access directly. You know, don't, don't care about these like few bytes that we may be wasting at that point because it really doesn't matter that much, right? And just do aligned access all the time. And now fun story. We actually had the same issues with Go code up until just recently because Go just released the version 1.21 in which they fixed a lot of alignment things on the RISC-V platform. So before uh, we had that release, uh, we actually had the same issue. So I was able to bring up a Linux kernel at some point and then I was running Uroot and then I saw, you know, the, the same th uh, thing that we see here. And so, well, you, you see lots of messages that is because I'm currently, you know, printing uh, debug information. So we are currently sort of handling misaligned access, but what we we'll really do is we just call back into Linux again for, you know, telling it to <laughs> uh, please handle this itself. Anyway, so now the um, thing is, because Go would be something that would you, uh, you would run in user land, right? So that would again run in a different context. So either you fix again that access issues in Go as they did, 
or if you have some software from let's say a third party or i don't know some something which you cannot really influence yourself the kernel would still need to take care of this so there is also now currently patches pending for the linux kernel uh you know which would actually uh, then take care of this here uh like in the linux kernel anyway so yeah that is something we had to deal with um now I want to talk about something else again. So we just did a very, very deep dive. Now we're uh, back on high level again. So actually we already looked at most of the interesting stuff here around all of our SBI implementation and so on, because that was really the gist of it. Now I would like to talk about some issue I encountered with the Linux kernel itself and with the peripherals and something I discovered, which I find very, very interesting when we talk about hardware. And for that, we will actually look at the, uh, hang on a second, here. We will now look at the schematics of that board. So on this board here, we have something which is called a PMIC or Power Management IC, IC for Integrated Circuit. This specific model here is an AXP 15060. Or 15 or 60, whatever you want to call it. And so the thing is, I wasn't able to bring up the Linux kernel at some point. It was always hanging when it was trying to talk to the Ethernet Phi. So the Phi is like the physical part on this platform here. It's outside the SOC. So within the SOC, we have the Mac, um, the uh, what is it called again? Machine something control or media access control. So those two need to communicate over a bus. It's called MDIO. And on this bus, well, I didn't get any responses. And the issue was, well, it could actually be multiple issues. But either way, I needed to supply power to the Phi. So what I saw when I took a closer look here is there is lines going over here in lots of directions. And some of them the pink ones here, they end up in this area. And I will zoom in a bit more. Now you can see it actually says VCC 3V3 Phi 0 and the same with Phi 1. And now on the other side, we have the Mac. In this case, it's a G Mac. So Mac is the media access control thingy. Uh, and that one, well, needs to be able to communicate here, right? So yeah, um, this is something that we need to configure in the Linux kernel. And so we currently have something which is still uh, a bit of work in progress, but, um, you know, Star5 are actually doing a very great job, you know, just upstreaming their patches. And so the Linux kernel that we have currently is, um, containing this device tree here. So I've now again done a bit of a split view and on the right hand side is the main device tree file for this board. So it's deriving from vision 5.2 and now this is the specific one for my board revision here. My board revision is 1.3b. So there was a like I think 1.2a and then it's 1.3b or something. Whatever anyway this is the board that we have. So on this here, we have two GMAX and we have two FIs, right? So they need to be able to communicate. And there is some entry that was missing here and it's called Phi Supply. So what I did here is I put the reference to VCC 3v3 here. So that is exactly what you saw in the schematics. Now with device trees, it can be a bit complicated. So this here is now referring to something which is defined in a different file, uh, namely that one here. So when we jump around, uh, there we go. So you see here under I squared C number five. So I squared C, the inter-integrated circuit bus, that is where the AXP chip is connected, our PMIC, our power management IC. And that one is divided into another few sections again. One of them is the regulators listing and the regulators are, well, those three here now, VCC, 3v3, CPU and VDD. Well, 
VDD is for eMMC. It's also like a kind of storage. Doesn't really matter right now. VDD is uh, for supplying power to the CPU itself. And this one here is now for the Phi. So yeah, I put those entries in here so that we get the 3.3 volts supplied to the Phi as we need it. Well, on, on the left hand side, this is where, uh, you know, actually this file in turn, uh, it builds on top of that one, right? So there is another include here. It's saying it's including that file here. Uh, JH71, oh, I actually got the wrong file here. I'm sorry. So it should be uh, this one. Yeah, now it makes a bit more sense. So yeah, so th this is how it works, right? So we started this file. This is for our specific board. This is what we include and then in turn that includes that file here. So yeah, and this is actually where you see also the ISA string. So yeah, this is something that is being passed onto Linux and that is you know what made up the very, very long string that we saw for um, the instructions supported on that platform, like you know, with all of those extensions here. Yeah, so the entry here is called risk five comma ISA. Anyway, so yeah, uh, that should be it now for today. Um, we've gone for like almost an hour. Uh, we, we had these interruptions with uh, Twitch today. So yeah, I don't, I don't want to risk like another few interruptions because it was a bit annoying. Um, so yeah, I will finish for today. Um, I hope this was very, very useful now. I will see how I can, you know, cut things together into one video file now and I will put that on YouTube as usual. So yeah, with that, thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, next time, um, yeah, we will look a bit deeper at some other stuff again, and we will see that we get SMT, uh, SMP to work eventually. Uh, also fix that uh, function that is still uh, keeping me from inserting a module into Linux and so on. So yeah, SMP, sorry, is the um, symmetric multiprocessing. That means we would be able to use multiple hearts. I'm not yet sure what needs to be done to support that, but yeah, I hope we can figure it out. Until then, Thank you and take care.